The Philippines has long been one of the major many countries in the world adapting and planting biotech crops. The country implements a science-based approach on the regulation of biotechnology products and continues to set the standard on the appropriate way of regulating the safe and responsible use of the technologies. However, despite the substantive gains and recorded benefits on the use of biotech crops in the country and elsewhere, misinformation about the technology continues to flow. Such Misinformation somehow shaped the perception of different stakeholders about agribiotechnology. As the technology advances from genetic transformation of plants to animals and from genetic engineering of traits to gene editing, it is expected that the scope and intensity of misinformation about modern agribiotechnologies may continue to expand and deepen. This webinar is part of the series of webinars on an array of topics about modern agribiotechnology in the Philippine context. This knowledge sharing and learning event, the first of the series, and intends to build up the knowledge base of participants on modern agribiotechnology applications and products and regulations. But before we start, a few house rules. This webinar will run for maximum of two hours and will be recorded for documentation purposes. Make sure that you have good internet connection so you will not miss any of the discussions. Please turn off your camera and your audio muted during the presentations to avoid any distractions. We encourage interaction exchange, thus we welcome questions from the participants. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen for any questions and clarifications you may have. Please indicate to whom you are directing the question. You may also use the raise hand button and we will allow you to speak. We will entertain the questions during the open discussion. We also encourage you to answer the poll questions to somehow gauge your understanding and recall of important information shared in the presentation. Also, we will ask you to answer a post webinar survey at the end of the webinar. This will be the basis of the issuance of your certificate of participation. Thank you very much for taking your time in attending this webinar and we look forward to your active participation. And for the key message, we have uh, Dr. Rodora Biasanza. She is professor at the Marine Science Institute, UP Diliman, and has served the university in various positions, including the first woman dean of the College of Science. She also served as assistant vice president for academic affairs and director of the Office of International Linkages or OIL. For her contributions to the biology and farming of seaweeds, which are sources of carrageenan, she became one of the members for seven years of the International Seaweed Association Council, a rare post for a woman. Dr. Asansa has more than 70 publications in international books and journals. She has extended her expertise to government agencies and international organizations, concurrently being the vice chairman of UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, or IOC, Panel for Harmful Algal Blooms, and leader of the IOC's Harmful Algal Bloom in Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia. She also coordinated the Asian Red Tide Network for more than 10 years. She has been actively involved in the production and dissemination of UNESCO OIC HAB, information and educational materials. She has, uh, Dr. Asadza received numerous scientific awards, including the 2013 UPAA Lifetime Dis Distinguished Achievement Awards from the uh, UP Alumni Association and the 2015 DOS DOST Picard Pantas Awardee for Most Outstanding Researcher and Scientist. She is also an academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology. Upon her retirement in July 2017, the UP Board of Regents approved her appointment as Professor Emeritus. Dr. Asansa, please, you can now deliver your message. So, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, ma'am. We can. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Magandang umaga sa ating lahat, especially the distinguished participants from the judiciary. On behalf of the National Academy of Science and Technology, Philippines, my warm greetings to the organizers and participants of today's webinar on biotechnology and regulation in the Philippines. 
to Dr. Aldemita of the International Service for the Acquisition of Agri-Biotech Application Incorporated. Thank you for inviting me to grace this important event. I am honored and pleased that I have been part of the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines for quite some time now. As a scientist involved in the discussions and decision-making on matters related to biotechnology and its regulation in the Philippines. In 2019, I was given the challenging task to chair the ad hoc committee to review the joint department circular, and that is between the Department of Science and Technology, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, the Department of Health, and the Department of Interior and Local Government. The circular is on the regulation for the research and development, funding and use, transboundary movement, release into the environment, and management of genetically modified plant and plant products derived from the use of modern biotechnology. Allow me first to acknowledge the members of our ad hoc committee. The vice chair is Dr. Clarida Carino of the BOST Biosafety Committee. And the members are the following, Dr. Enelea Kukala, Kau, I mean, Dr. Merlin Nenjoro, Dr. Jane Reyes, Dr. Agnes Rola, Dr. Abraham Manalo, Dr. Vicencio Mamaril, Attorney Jose Maria Ochave, Dr. Maria Lorele Abagala, Dr. Mary uh, Jelica, Attorney Simonette Lim, Ms. Maria Lourdes Santiago, Engineer Jolene Asoria, and Mr. Charles Anthony Vega. Of course, we were assisted by the NCBP Secretariat particularly Raymond Corona. The exhaustive and critical review of the joint circular was completed in 2021, despite the difficulties due primarily to the COVID-19 pa pandemic that impacted the latter part of our activities. As in other government circulars and other documents, the final form of the joint circular underwent the very de detailed review of the ad hoc committee, which was in charge of considering both the scientific soundness and the legal and administrative aspects of the contents of the circular. Existing or new laws and other regulations relevant to the revision of the circular were incorporated like the law on the ease of doing business in the government. This was to consider timely and efficient processing of documents in the application and approval for biotechnology practices and products based on a robust review of this scientific knowledge needed to make such changes relevant to the enhancement of the joint circular. The revised joint circular passed through a further review of the different departments involved, the members of the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines, chaired by Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology, Dr. Fortunato de la Peña, and a multi-stakeholders consultation meeting held in 2021. The final form of the revised joint circular was approved and completely signed by the secretaries of the Department of Science and Technology, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, and the Department of Interior and Local Government. I likewise signed the document representing the National Academy of Science and Technology. Allow me at this point to mention that the National Academy of Science and Technology as the highest advisory body to the president and the cabinet on matters related to science and technology has always given paramount importance 
to the review and support for biotechnology that includes the development of science for its practice and regulation in the Philippines. Allow me to mention also that even the legislative and sometimes the uh, judiciary uh, seek our advice on matters relating so, to science and technology. There was even an instance when the Philippine Supreme Court sought the advice of the Academy when it reviewed the, de the decision on BT Talon. It is now a call, almost a common knowledge that there was a time there was a big campaign against GMOs in the Philippines. And the public had its complete, almost complete aversion towards products believed to be GMOs. With the continuing efforts led by the government, particularly the National Committee on the Bio Biosafety of the Philippines, the academe, and other NGOs and NGAs, and the, stakehold the stakeholders and the general public have been properly informed that decisions on R&D, handling, use, and management of these plants and plant products are all science-based in the protection of the people, the other resources, and the, and the environment. Permit me also to acknowledge the paramount significance of today's webinar on biotechnology and regulation and its regulation in the Philippines. The education of the stakeholders and the entire citizenry on these concerns and issues would redound to a better appreciation of the contributions of science, technology, and innovation to meet humanity's increasing problems, especially those relating to food security and safety. My sincere gratitude to the members of the ADO committee that reviewed the JTC, the NCB Secretariat, the Secretaries of the OST, DA, DOH, DNR, and the DILG for the splendid job done in the completion of the revised JTC in the midst of a pandemic. The National Academy of Science and Technology enjoins everyone towards a science, technology, and innovation supported collective efforts for a prosperous Philippines as embodied in our NAST DOST foresight entitled Pagtanao 2050, wherein we emphasize biotechnology as one of the key scientific tools for the country's development. I wish the speakers and participants and an enlightening and dynamic webinar. Thank you and maraming salamat. Mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asansa, for the warm greetings and sharing some relevant information about the revised JDC, and also for highlighting the paramount uh, significance of the webinar in biotechnology regulation. We are more than honored to have you in this webinar. Thank, again, thank you very much, Dr. Asansa. Now we will proceed uh, to our first uh, presentation on biotechnology products, applications, and benefits. And it, this will be delivered by Dr. Rodora Romero Aldemita. She leads the development and publication of the annual global status of commercialized biotech GM crops or, ICE, or what we call ISA briefs. Uh, she coordinates the activities of ISA's biotechnology information centers in the region, as well as capacity building activities on biotechnology and biosafety in Asia. In partnership with USDA and the Philippine Department of Agriculture Biotechnology Program Office. Dr. Aldimita holds a PhD in botany from Purdue University in USA and postdoctoral fellowship on golden rice at Albert Ludwig University in Germany. She served as science, chief science research specialist at the biotechnology coordination and the biotechnology coordination at Phil Rice and former researcher at ERI. She is a recipient of various awards, including the Outstanding Young Scientist by the National Academy of Science and Technology 
the NAS and Italy based the World Academy of Science, TWAS. Science Prize in Biology, 10 Outstanding Women and Nations Service from Towns Foundation, Most Outstanding Senior Researcher, Appeal Rice, Filipino Paces of Biotechnology Award as Outstanding, outstanding Agricultural Biotechnologist and Science Communicator by the Department of Agriculture uh, Biotechnology Program Office and the 2020 UPLB College Distinguished Award for Excellence in International Service and Cooperation. Dr. Ola, uh, Ola, please, you can now share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Popen. Now, uh, let me, it's already shared, right? Okay. Um, slideshow. So thank you very much again for the kind introduction. I'm very honored to be here as one of the uh, panelists, one of the speakers, as well as uh, a co-organizer in this activity. So my talk would be on biotechnologies, products, applications, and benefits. And when I uh, uh, invited, when we invited the judiciary, we are really trying to, we will try to provide you the simplest way of uh, to, to be able to understand uh, biotechnology, the products, applications, and benefits. So why, why do you, we need biotechnologies? This is because of the high global population. We are having a cl climate change already. We're feeling it ourselves in, in our everyday living. We don't know when to plant and uh, what are we expecting. At this time of the year, we should be having summer, but we are experiencing a lot of rains. And also we have, uh, because of climate change, we have 20% likelihood of severe food insecurity and undernutrition in low income countries. So with more than 820 million hungry people achieving the, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations by 2030, having zero hunger will not be possible without the use of biotechnology. So here I present to you how biotechnology is developed or what are the sciences involved. So in the left side, we can see that, that through traditional breeding, we are able to produce different varieties of crops. And we know that uh, sexual reproduction of plants would lead to new varieties, but this will be incurring a long time. So our scientists through the years have developed many different processes. And one of those would be mutagenesis. We have already gained a lot of uh, impact using uh, radiation, chemical mutagenesis. And uh, in, in so doing, we have new crops like oranges, we have cereals, especially we have rice varieties back then, but this would not suffice. So by 1980s, our scientists developed the technology called transgenics and then later on genome editing. So I'm going to discuss this transgenics and the genome editing. Both of these uh, processes include the use of uh, genetic engineering and this is the basis of that technology of those technologies that all organisms contain the genetic code of life, which is the DNA. And the pairing of these sequences will allow us to improve animals, plants, microorganisms, and also aquaculture or fishes and our shrimps and all that. So in so doing, we can have new variations in the field for food sustainability and uh, accessibility. Due to biotechnology or genetic engineering, we are now able to fight disease, we increase yield, we have environment friendly technologies and products, we have safer crops, we have nutritious food, and better industry. And uh, the ISA has, ISA has been documenting this biotech crops from 1996. And currently we have around 190.4 million hectares of crops planted all over the world, divided in developing and industrialized countries. So we can see here that 
developing countries had advanced more than the industrialized countries in terms of area planted. And so in the region, in our Asia Pacific, these are the countries which are planting uh, by the crops, the one in green colored in this map. So we have Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Australia, Indonesia, and uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, and China. Importing countries include Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, and um, sorry, and Turkey. Now, I would like to emphasize here that we in in in, uh, in the Asia Pacific region, most of the crops planted are cotton, by the cotton, maize. And uh, in Australia, we have a few, a few more crops like canola and safflower. So because of biotechnology, the many years that we have been planting by the crops, so this is data from Graham Brooks stating the benefits of biotech crops to food security, sustainability, and climate change. Most especially, we would like to focus on the crop productivity, which here shows around 225 billion in gains uh, uh, by farmers globally. So this is the data from 1996 to 2018. We also provide a better environment since we don't need to use a lot of um, products that would harm the environment, especially the decrease in the use of crop protection products because our farmers can, take, uh, can already have products which have uh, the, the capacity to resist diseases and pests. And also we can conserve biodiversity because we're not, we are no longer um, unplowing and um, using or denuding our forests because our productivity is good enough to feed our people. We reduce carbon dioxide emissions. And then uh, we also, uh, this is the most important thing, we alleviate poverty and hunger of the 17 million farmers and their families totaling 65 million people. So this data is good enough for our, uh, for the last 25 years. But of course, we have to make sure that our, um, what happened to this? Sorry, yeah. We have to make sure that our, the Philippine situation is also the same. So with the Philippine biotech status, this is what we have. So we have crops in, uh, approved for import. We have for food, feed and processing. We have alfalfa, canola, cotton, eggplant, maize, potato, rice, soybean, and sugar beets. If you would want to see the details of this, you can do a, you can visit uh, our ISA website with the GEM approval database. And benefits by farmers have accrued as well. So you see here the 2003 to 2018, we have 80, uh, 872.6 million dollars income benefits by farmers. And by 2018 alone, we have $87.7 million. And this is only because of planting biotech corn, which you can see here. So this is the, the deceased one or uh, with, with uh, Aspergillus niger because it's black. And you can see there that these are the eaten parts by the worms or by uh, the Asian corn borer. And this is now the clean one or the GM one. Now, upcoming Pinoy biotech products include golden rice. So we can see here the normal rice and the beta carotene enriched rice, which will somehow make our uh, uh, population, which are very much having vitamin A deficiency. And also we will have BT eggplant, which has been given approval for food feed and processing. Well, golden rice has been approved for cultivation as, as you already know. And then we have BT cotton, which is still under multi-locational trial. So the Philippines is uh, leading in our Asian region. So we hope that 
we will continue this as we progress with the new technologies of genome editing. So this is what I'm going to work uh, through now, walk through. So currently we have, I have discussed with you the technology of genetic modification and how it has benefited all over the world, the global. And now we're looking into genome editing, which is a new technology that will be able to provide much faster, much cheaper, and more precise technology for this, for the development of new products for food sustainability. So these are the potential benefits in agriculture to farmers because we will improve the pace and scope of innovation to deliver better seed products. We can have consumer, consumer groups will, which will have a variety of uh, products to choose from. I'll discuss with you in a little while. And the planet because we have farming solutions that will allow for smarter use. So these are the potential applications. I'm not going to discuss with, uh, read to you, you can read it well. And so these are now, uh, I would like to invite you to come to the ISA website. We have a genome editing resource, which will provide you more information on these products. And we have a book, which is downloadable for free. This has been published since December, and this will provide you the, the beginnings or the primer on genome editing, which is written by experts in the field. So let's move on. So the first edited product on the market, sorry, is the soybean, which is high oleic acid because it, um, it cuts, sorry. It cuts this, pathway so that there is an increase on oleic acid. This has been uh, commercialized in the US firstly, and it's now available in the market. The second one is the GABA tomato, which has been approved for commercialization in September, 2021. And it's now available also in the market. So this will be, enhance it enhances blood pressure lowering. And we have a lot of gene edited crops in the pipeline or genome edited crops in the pipeline. We have Camelina, which has high oil content, which is now approved in Canada and uh, the US and not regulated in Argentina. Canola with shorter to, uh, branches to minimize lodging. And so it will be easier to harvest and the yield is higher. We have disease resistant pepper resistant to um, pepper venal model virus. We have wheat, this is in France. This, we have wheat which has resistance to powdery mildew in China. We have maize which is drought resistant and with lower lignin content for better digestibility as lice silage. This is in Netherlands. We have barley with delayed germination. So we are now looking at abiotic stresses or environmental stresses, which are being improved for, through genome editing. For consumer traits, as we know, consumer traits focus on what we want to eat, what we want to taste as consumers. So we have sorghum, which has fragrance for food, liquor and vinegar brewing in China, potato with decreased cold induced sweetening and acrylamide formation, and it prevents food wastage as well. So this is in Australia. Consumer traits also for potato, a uh, tomato with increased sugar content by 30% in Japan. Shikori with source of natural sweetener inulin. And so it's easier to process this uh, alternative sweetener for our diabetic uh, population. Uh, genome editing, edited crops, another one is for wheat with reduced asparagine to reduce acrylamide during baking and toasting. So you can see here the non-genome edited and the genome edited ones at the bottom, at the top, genome edited ones at the top. So you can see the burning that happens and it, 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 it has reduced acrylamide. Canola, which is resistant to white mold in the USA as well. So in the Philippines, let's see what we're having in the Philippines. We have high lycopene tomato and low phytic corn being researched at the Institute of Plant Breeding, UPLB. We have optimal amylose content or soft grains rice at the field rice. And then bacterial blight resistant rice, tumor resistant rice in resistant rice 
and improved yield in rice as well at the International Rice Research Institute. So the Philippines is already preparing for this uh, development of uh, improved crops through genome editing. Now let's move on into fishes. So we have, this is in Japan. We have genome edited fishes in, the, in Japan with sea bream, with, uh, which has increased growth rate. Puffer fish as well, for which has gained appetite and weight. So you can see here the Nanji genome edited and the genome edited. We have genome edited animals with, uh, with sleek hair coat to better regulate their internal body temperature so that it, they can increase the capacity for sweating. So this is for the effect of climate change in animals and how they can regulate their body temperatures. We have a typical, uh, we have Horned dairy cow, which is typical. Now they have genome edited cow without horns. So this is important for our farmers, their exposure in the farm to this um, horned dairy cow. So it, it's, it's safer now for them. And this is very important for us, genome editing in healthcare. So we have a tremendous potential for the production of antibiotics, complex antibiotics, not only in the UK, but also in other parts of the world. So this is the regulatory landscape. How are things being regulated or are the policy considerations on genome editing all over the world? So you can see here the blue colored ones with recent policy updates and uh, genome edited crops being, or SDN1 genome edited products being regulated as conventional or, or uh, not, um, uh, being regulated at all, SDN1. And then red products should be, uh, red countries should be, uh, SDN1 gene edited products, uh, they, they are treating them as GMO based. So, and regulation. So we have Europe and uh, South Africa. And then yellow countries where we have policy making decisions are being discussed currently for SDN1 as conventional new varieties. So currently, uh, as in the past uh, few months from January, there are many things that have changed. So in China, they have a new regulation for genome editing, as well as in Nigeria, in the UK, in Japan and Canada, which looks at genome edited crops as non-GM. And uh, some of them are looking at them as conventional crops. Acceptance of genome editing has been increasing and we have examples here from Germany, from uh, China, where knowing the technology will provide them information and they will be willing to accept and utilize, consume genome edited crops as well as in Korea. So one of the things that our consumers need our objective information provided by the government on, by, on these technologies. We have to promote and educate our public. And it is important for appropriate risk communication and dissemination of scientific information. And this is crucial because we know and uh, through biotechnology, we can see that this is a projection by Adroit Market Research that genome editing market is increasing due to various organisms, uh, applications in various organisms and in healthcare. And this is my last slide. I'd like to highlight the importance of biotech. So uh, this is a study by Edgerton way back in 2008. And we are seeing this promise of increasing yield only I mean, yield uh, per se, but we know that through biotechnology, we can have contributions in food sustainability, environmental safety, and productivity. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Tokola, uh, for providing us an overview of the biotechnology applications and products. And you also focus on the gene editing applications and uh, the global regulatory approaches in uh, in regulating this uh, uh, technology. So let me introduce Mr. Corona. He is the project senior technical specialist of the National Committee 
on Biosafety of the Philippines, DOST. He serves as Secretariat of the Ad Hoc Technical Working Group of the NCBP, including the revision of the Joint Department Circular No. 1, Series of 2016. Mr. Corona is currently taking his Master of Public Affairs, specializing on strategic planning and policy studies at the College of Public Affairs and Development, UP Los Baños. He obtained his BS in Agricultural Biotechnology, major in Food Biotechnology at UPLB. He was formerly a technical staff of the Biotechnology Office, Bureau of Plant Industry, and a research assistant of the Bureau of Agriculture and Fishery Standards, Department of Agriculture. Mr. Corona, the mic is yours. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me loud and clear? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'll share my presentation. So this is quite uh, a long presentation, so hope everyone can bear with me. Because for this morning, I have to deliver a presentation on three policies or, or three issuances by uh, the Philippine government. So the outline of my presentation, uh, as I have said earlier, we will tackle three uh, policies or three issuances pertaining to the regulation of uh, modern biotechnology here in our country. First, the DOSE, DA, DNR, DOH, Joint Department Circular, Series of 2021, or as we call it, JDC. The second is the NCBP Resolution Number 1, Series of 2020. And the third is the DA Random Circular Number 8, Series of 2022. Um, let us first focus on the JDC one. So JDC uh, provides the rules and regulations for the research and development, handling and use, transboundary movement, release into the environment, and management of genetically modified plant and plant products derived from the use of modern biotechnology. So the outline of this document, actually it has 10 articles. So before I go uh, one by one on the articles, uh, I would like to inform everyone that JD number one, series 2021, is an updated version of the 2016 JDC. Uh, so, uh, based on the implementation and the experiences by all the stakeholders uh, during the five-year uh, span, we built on the points of improvements of the DC 2016. Hence, we came up with JDC 1 uh, series of 2021, uh, and most especially taking into account the coming into force of the ease of doing business law, which limits the government transactions maximum to 20 working days, subject extension for highly technical uh, uh, transactions such as this kind of government transaction. So the GDC 2021 has general provisions. Uh, it provides also the principles for buy safety decisions on how the government decides uh, in making a buy safety decision. It also provides the administrative framework. How would we implement it, who are the agencies involved, and what are their functions. Article 4 is the contained use of regulated articles. Article 5 is the field trial. Number 6 is the commercial propagation of regulated articles. Uh, Article 7 is the direct use for food, feed, or for processing. Article 8, this is what the new, uh, uh, new point of the Joint Department Circular. It's the uh, our policy on stock events or those events which has two or more uh, regulated articles in the product. Article 9, important of regulatory artic regulated articles. So essentially, this is a reiteration of our uh, national policy on quarantine. And Article 10, the miscellaneous provisions, uh, focusing on the petition for reconsideration and the uh, transitory provisions, repealing clause, reliability, and effectivity. So the legal basis of JDC number one, series of 2021. So of course, uh, these uh, policies or national laws, issue one says, are uh, integrated in the craft of JDC 2021. Of course, it should be consistent with the Philippine Constitution, 
the Cartagena Protocol on Vice Safety. So this is an international treaty wherein Philippines is one of the party. Hence, we have an obligation to actually uh, align our policy on modern biotechnology to the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. The EO 14 series of 2006 or the National Biosafety Framework. We also have EO number 292 or the Agreed Code of 1987, which provides directions on the mandate and scope of some of the government agencies in the implementation of GDC. We have PD 1433 or the Plan 14 Law of 1978. Actually, this is the anchor uh, where we stand on or where we uh, built on our biosafety regulations, Plan Quarantine Law. EO number 192 or the Organization Act of the DENR, it created the mandate, the scope and the mandate of the DNR. Uh, RA 7160, the Local Government Code of 1991. This is very relevant for the field trial stage of uh, uh, type of application here under the GDC. Food Safety Act of 2013, 10611, R794, the Consumer Act of Philippines, and 1103, Ease of Doing Business Law, which I have described a while ago. So we go now to the salient features of the JDC1. And don't worry, I won't be bombarding you with a step-by-step -step process, how an application is uh, received, then processed, then uh, issued with a buy safety permit. So first, let's focus on uh, this, making biosafety decisions. So when the government uh, makes a biosafety decision for a specific application or a specific GMO, these are the things that we need to consider. These are principles we need to adhere to. Standard of precaution, uh, the lack of scientific consensus doesn't, should not hinder the government agency to take, government agency to take steps uh, for protection. Number two, risk assessment. This is the central uh, component or this is part of making a biosafety decision. To make a biosafety decision based on the risk that uh, uh, a regulated RTL uh, confronts you. So you can't make biosafety decisions out of the thin air or unfounded by scientific evidences. The risk assessment process, uh, we, we should uh, we use evidences to support our biosafety decision. Environmental health risk assessment, it's just the same as the risk assessment, only it gives focus or emphasis on the role of, uh, of, of, of protecting the environment and human and animal health. Social, social economic, ethical, and cultural consideration this thing uh, internationally uh, is somehow not uh, related or is not a part of the by of the biology concept. However, uh, it is one of the considerations that uh, the Kahina Protocol uh, tells its parties to take into consideration in making a decision. But economic, ethical, and cultural considerations is separate from uh, findings that you make in the risk assessment. Access to information, uh, the public must be able to access by safety related information, transparency in public participation, the public is part of the decision making process. There are avenues for the public to take part and provide their comments on the applicate by safety applications and of course prompt and efficient action which is which follows the EO uh, the RA11032 or the East Wing Business Law. The role of the national government agencies as you can tell from the title of the document uh, it involves the function of the five government agencies. DA should lead addressing by safety issues related to the country's agricultural productivity and security and leads in evaluation of and monitoring of regulated articles. Actually, the DA through the Bureau of Plant Industry issues the by safety permit under the Joint Department Circular. The DOST the ensuring that the science is utilized and applied in adopting by safety policies and making by safety decisions. 
it should also lead in evaluating and monitoring contained use of related articles or the laboratory scale or the small scale limited time controlled uh, testing of the MOs that is not intended for commercial release as of yet. For DENR, uh, the DNR is mandated to ensure that the applicable environmental assessments are undertaken and potential impact identified. They should also lead in the evaluation and monitoring for cases related to bioremediation, improvement of genetic resources, and wildlife genetic resources. So it is safe to say that uh, the DNR may uh, recommend to do a certain environmental assessment of a GM crop, then that their metrics is applicable for the context of use or context of uh, transient agricultural activity. So they cannot impose uh, uh, regulations that is not applicable for biosafety or uh, for R&D activities related to crops. Department of Health, on the other hand, formulates guidelines and these results of assessing the health imposed by modern biotechnology. They lead in the elevation and monitoring of processed foods derived from, derived from or containing GMOs. This is in accordance with the food safety law. Actually, even the Department of Agriculture has a role in uh, the assessment of food and feed safety. And lead the DILG, the ALG oversees the implementation of the activities taken in specific LGUs in relation to the conduct of public consultation required by the LG code. So this, uh, their role is prominent on the field trial stages of the circular. So under this circular, uh, a joint assessment group is established composed of qualified representatives from the personnel of department by safety committees. So each department DA, DNR, DOST, DOH shall send representatives for uh, to compose the joint assessment group. And they are mandated to evaluate applications for field trial, commercial propagation, and direct use. So this is every department except for the LG shall send two representatives for each joint assessment group. Um, for a specific application, a joint assessment group established. However, if there's a specific learn or technical issue in the application that can't be addressed with the limitation of expertise in all of the uh, department by safety committees, one third external technical expert may be engaged to address specific issues in the application. He or she would not be a member of the joint assessment group, but uh, he or she may uh, actually assist the joint assessment group in resolving a specific technical issue in the application. So the timeline for processing of biosafety applications, roughly uh, the joint uh, department circular for 40 working days from acceptance of complete application up to the issue once of a safety permit. Again, uh, highly technical uh, processes or uh, transactions with the government should be limited to 20 workings only, but can be applied or subject to extension not more than additional 20 working days. Hence, the timeline of 40 working days provided by GC. So the three days is uh, uh, for the pre-assessment. So uh, it is for the committees to choose their representatives for a specific application. Seven days assessment period, this is the risk assessment component, and the public participation phase. Concurrently, a, pub, a public participation is being undertaken. Uh, for example, for field trial, uh, a public hearing is required and uh, a proposal must, uh, must be able to secure a resolution for the locality where the field trial will be implemented. But for commercial propagation and direct use, public participation comes in the form of posting of these applications in the BPI uh, websites. And then after the 27 days, after three days, so that's 30 days, so 
more or less BPI director is given five days to make a buy safety decision based on the recommendations made by the joint assessment group and the public comments that the Bureau of Plant Industry was able to collect. This would be used by the uh, as basis by the BPI director to make a buy safety decision to approve or to not approve a specific application. So another salient salient point joint department circular is our policy in GM plants and plant products with stock events. So stock events are plant pro plants produced through conventional bidding of GM parent lines with approved individual events are not considered novel. For example, uh, an individual event, uh, uh, tech, uh, Biotech Trait A is approved, Biotech Trait B is approved, Biotech Trait C is approved uh, in a single crop, in the same crop, then they are mixed, uh, they are combined together through conventional breeding. So you come up with a crop with the uh, uh, biotech trait ABC all together in one single crop. For those kinds of uh, cases, they will not be considered, considered novel and should will not undergo the uh, tedious process of the 40 working day. Instead, the permit her holder or an authorized licensee of registered events may request for listing of their stock events in the BPI approval registry for commercial propagation or BPI approval registry for direct use as the case may be. It's very important, especially for importers because uh, the approval registry serves as one of the basis whether the plant quarantine officers in the import area or airports will allow the entry of these uh, genetic modified crops. Permit holder or an authorized licensee of registered FS may also request the BPI for the listing of any stocks or intermediate stocks. Let's say there, in a specific crop, it contains five biotech traits, A, B, C, D, E. So any subset of it, for example, I develop a crop which only contains A, C, and D, would not undergo the 40-day processing period. The crop A, C, E would not undergo any substack or intermediate tax as long as the individual events are approved did not go uh, the same uh, regulatory track. Instead, you would request for its inclusion in the PI approval registry. Another uh, that is introduced in the JDC 2021 is the data transport the purity of environmental risk assessment trials. So regulate articles developed in other countries may be filed directly for a safety permit for field trial. Philippines, if the Bureau of Industry determines that the data generated in other countries is applicable to the law setting. Petition for the consideration. Uh, in any case, the application in the case of applications, I, I, an aggrieved party may file a request for the reconsideration of the decision. So it will be filed to the DA secretary within 15 days from the announcement of the decision. Mind you that every decision would be uploaded at the same day as the Bureau of Industry uh, website. And the uh, applicant would be notified if their application has been granted by safety permit. Hence, it would serve as the starting point of the 15 working days right, uh, from the announcement of the decision. It would be easy to track. It'd be easy for bio, uh, Bureau of Plant Industry to determine the 50 working days period for the petition for reconsideration. Transitory provision provides that all existing original and renewed by safety permits for commercial propagation and direct use issued therein shall be valid unless otherwise spoke. So in the new joint department circular, by safety permits uh, essentially does not expire, but it doesn't mean that it is not related. In fact, as long as uh, there's a by safety permit, a specific crop, as long as it's not uh, revoked, uh, the applicant or the permit holder in this case should follow the permit conditions provi uh, provided to them for the specific crop. Because in the previous JDC, 
uh, bio safety permit for bio safety uh, for propagation and direct use is only valid for five years and should be renewed every five years. So uh, with the implementation of or the coming into force of 2021, all the existing safety permits, valid by safety permits, shall remain valid unless it would be revoked for uh, reasons provided in the Section J or Section 18J of the Joint Department Pillar. Okay, so that's the Joint Department Pillar in a nutshell. Though uh, the document is quite long, it is 30 pages long, uh, it pro really provides a, a good understanding on how the regulatory agencies uh, conduct their role or how they uh, regulate uh, GM plants and plant products here in our country. So now we go to the second uh, policy or issue ones. It's the NCBP Resolution Number 1, Series of 2020, Regulation of Plant and Plant Products Derived from the Use of Plant Breeding Innovations or New Plant Breeding Techniques. So th this is only a two to three slide uh, portion. So in 2020, uh, the NCBP decided to create a technical working group that would look at the study made by the Department of Agriculture uh, on new breeding techniques. So some of you may know new breeding techniques are uh, quite, hence the name. And the Department of Agriculture uh, took the initiative to uh, make a study to look at the different technologies or techniques used in new breeding techniques, how other countries uh, regulate such technologies. And the outcome of their study, the of their study was submitted to the NCBP. And one of the recommendations for the NCBP to create or issue a policy, a policy on new breeding techniques. Hence the technical working groups created. And before the end of 2020, the technical working group was told to come up with the draft resolution to be added by the NCBP on regulation of plant and plant products derived from the use of plant breeding innovations or new breeding techniques. In the case of the Philippines, uh, instead of calling entities just as 10 BTs, uh, our experts uh, opted to use or adopt the term breeding innovations because uh, what what is new right now may be new in the next few years, given the fast development of such technology. Hence, to avoid that name being too dated, which adopted the term plant breeding innovations. So you might not encounter the term plant breeding innovations in other countries. Um, most often than that, you will encounter the term new plant breeding techniques or new breeding techniques. Uh, and let it be known that in our context, those are synonyms. Okay, so based on the findings of the ad technical working group, a product of plant breeding innovation is considered a GMO or genetically modified organism if they contain a novel combination of genetic material obtained using modern biotechnology. So you have two conditions. Uh, it has a novel combination of genetic material and was obtained using modern biotechnology. A PBI product will not be considered a GMO, it would be considered as a conventional product if they do not contain a novel combination of a genetic material. Only PBI derived GM plants or GMO, GMO uh, PBI products and plant products would be regulated under the JDC1. So that, that's the key uh, takeaway here in resolution that not all products, plant breeding innovations would undergo the joint department's regular, only those which will be con uh, considered or classified as GMO product. And lastly, the said resolution stated that the Department of Agriculture shall issue guidelines and take the lead in evaluating and monitoring plant and plant products derived from the use of modern biotechnology including plant breeding innovations. So this is consistent with the mandate of the Department of Agriculture. And given that, we now go to the last part of the presentation, the DA Memorandum Number 8, 
series of 2022. So before I move forward with this, I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Abraham Manalo. Uh, he is a member of the ad hoc technical group for the review of the JDC and a mem- technical member of the, uh, the group in the Department of Agriculture who came up with this memorandum circular. I believe this circular has not yet been uh, issued to the public, but I think this uh, it's closed. The Department of Agriculture is just uh, doing some arrangements to follow the proper procedure of issue ones of a regulatory uh, policy. Uh, let me first come back. Okay. So this memorandum circular provides rules and procedures to evaluate and determine whether products of PBIs are covered under the JDC based on the NCBP resolution of 2020. So you can see the connection between the three documents or the three issue one set. So the DA memorandum circular has, I think, 15 sections. So let's just uh, go through it. Section 1, general classification products of PBIs. Section 2, PBI products falling under the scope and coverage of DC. Section 3, defines the product developer. Section 4, it provides the mandate and the impl- uh, process how uh, the BPI biotechnology team, plant breeding innovations would do their Section 5, technical consultation for evaluation and determination. So this uh, Section 5 is actually the process. Technical consultation for evaluation and determination. Section 6, procedural requirements for the conduct of a TECD. Section 7, compliance with other regulations. Section 8, target PBI products. Section 9 is appeal. 10 is confidential information. 11, mutual recognition agreement. Section 12, funding. 13, repealing clause. 14, separability. 15, effectivity. So we now go to the salient features of the DAMC number 8 series of 2022. So again, the basis of this uh, issue ones uh, are JDC number one series of 2021 and the NCBP resolution series of 2020. The general classification of products of PBI, so essentially a product of PPI can be a GMO or a non-GMO. They reiterated the decision made in the NCBP resolution. A product developer. So this policy or issue ones defined who is a product developer. So a product developer is uh, any person who developed the PBI product submitted for the evaluation and determination of its regulatory status under JDC 2021. So as you see, the DAMC number eight series of 2022 is anchored to JDC 2021. So if you're not developed for any of the departments or agencies of the Philippine government, a university with research institutions in the Philippines, an international research organization duly recognized by the Philippine government, a corporation registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission of the Philippines, or a cooperative registered with the Cooperative Development Authority of the Philippines. So if a non-resident product developer is interested uh, to undergo the evaluation and determination under the DAMC number 8, it shall appoint an agent who is a resident of the Philippines and shall be in charge with all the submissions and official communications with the Department of Agriculture. So again, a non-resident product developer is allowed, actually, given that an agent would actually serve as the middleman or the counterpart of the non-resident product developer here in the Philippines. So the PPI Biotech core team, plant breeding iron, it shall be composed of qualified technical staff from the Bureau of Industry and chaired by the BI Assistant Director for Regulatory Services. For every of the accepted request, it shall form a technical consultation for evaluation and determination group composed of three members with at least two members from the BCT PBI. You may see some similarities between the approach of the DAS number eight and the Joint Department Circular. Uh, what we like to emphasize in these two nuances is we are empowering our own regulators. We are empower, uh, making use of the technical capacity 
knowledge and knowledge of uh, organic personnel from these government agencies to actually carry out the regulatory process. The TC, the TC group shall be responsible for the conduct of technical evaluation and determination on the regulatory status of the PPI product under the DCS a series 2021. So for JTC 2021, the end, the end goal of an application is to secure a by safety permit, which would allow you to carry on with your activity regardless if it's field trial, it's commercial propagation, or direct use. So the timeline for the DAMC number eight, I think is more or less 32 working days. So this is still consistent with the uh, uh, ease of doing business law, which uh, essentially provides us up to 50 working days for highly technical applications. So after official determination, so the BPI has determined that a PBA product is GMO. If that's the case, they should inform the product developer in writing that it's under the scope and coverage of GDC 2021 and should advise the product developer to proceed with the application process under GDC 2021. Should the product developer be interested to secure a buy safety permit, essentially to move forward with their uh, R&D activities, commercial activities. On the other hand, if a PBA product is not a GMO, a certificate of coverage shall be issued, shall be made uh, available to the public, uh, meaning the public should be informed that the specific PBI product was determined to be non-covered by JDC 2021. Target PBI products. So this is more on, uh, more on consideration of the research and development uh, institution, r and uh, r and institutions, research institutions. So if there's a case where in PI products are still in the product concept or r and phase, they may file a request to TECED and shall follow the same rules only for purposes of anticipating. So it's just like checking whether our product being developed would be covered by GM regulations or non-GM regulations. In such case, the TCED group may perform a preliminary analysis, provide an indicative answer. In the event that these products are developed or obtained in the future, this shall be subject to provision of the foregoing sections in order to confirm that such materialized PBI products contain the type of genetic change posed in the pre preliminary consultation. So this is very important because uh, there's a big difference if you would be covered under the department particular or not. Uh, to cut the story short, it would require, uh, it would be much cheaper if you would not be covered under the joint department circular. Because as you know, once you undergo regulations, there are regulatory costs involved in the product development of these uh, products. So it is expected that if your product would be covered under JDC, uh, you should be prepared to uh, actually shell out regulatory that's involved for the buy safety application. So appeal again within 15 working days from the receipt of the product developer of the decision or posting in the API website, an aggrieved party may uh, actually file an appeal to DA secretary. Uh, the appeal or the petitions for reconsideration are always uh, filed to the DA secretary since the issuing uh, entity or of the determination or the vice safety permit in the case of JDC1 is the BPI director. So it's uh, essentially an authority above the BPI director. Mutual re recognition agreements. The DA, upon the recommendation and facilitation by the Bureau of Plant Industry, may enhance operation with counterpart competent authorities of other countries to establish recognition agreements or arrangements on the determination of classification of PBA products and international agreements to which the Philippines is a party. So this is essentially recognition that plant breeding innovations is an evolving 
technology is an evolving approach and uh, actually uh the case in the Philipp in the country that of regulating this is not really much different from the other countries so uh the da recognizes the fact that information sharing is essential to ensure uh that we follow the best available science in terms of regulating uh, BBI products. So this is the process flow of the conduct of the TCED. Again, based on my computation, if it's not, uh, if it's correct, it's more or less 30 to 32 working days, which again falls uh, within 40 day maximum period that we can be allowed under the ease of doing business law. And this would be the last slide. So this is decision three on the regulation of plant and plant products derived from the modern biotechnology. Pro essentially, it provides a visualization of these known plant breeding innovation techniques and what we expect uh, its final product would be. For example, uh, again, for a product to be considered GMO, in the context of the Philippines, number one, it should be produced through modern biotechnology and it should have a novel combination introduced uh, by the modern biotechnology. If in those questions, both you would answer yes, then it is expected that the product of the technique would be considered as GMO, as you can see in this uh, decision tree. And the uh, right side of this uh, of this tree actually most of it or some of it are not really considered as plant breeding innovations, but it is, it is there or it is uh, provided there by the technical working group to actually help the public visualize that this, uh, some of the plant breeding innovation or some of the new breeding techniques being used is essentially the same as those occurring in the nature. So not, uh, the expected product would be non-GMO. Yeah. So before I end my uh, presentation, and again, apologies for the technical uh, issues we have encountered, let me share you, with you the one of the slides of DA Secretary William Dar. Uh, together, let us find ways to extend the benefits of gene editing technologies across the agriculture sectors of our nations. And at least at the level of the five departments, uh, we are working together to ensure that the regulations are robust and at the same time facilitative and it's always based on the best available science. And we appreciate this kind of forum so that we can actually reach out to, the, to other stakeholders here in our country and uh, provide you with an overview of how we conduct our business. So again, thank you very much. If you want to contact us, here is the contact details of the National Committee on Bicep of the Philippines. Maraming salamat po. Okay, thank you very much, Raymond, for uh, presenting the sil uh, salient provisions and features of the revised JDC, the NCBP Resolution 001, and uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, Memo Circular Number 8, a series of 2022. Uh, can we have the poll question now? Okay, uh, I encourage the participants to answer the poll question, please. And may I request Raymond, uh, somebody is asking about where they can access uh, the, the documents that you uh, presented the revised JDC, the NCBP resolution 001 right. and the DAMC 8 2022. Can you put the, the link in the chat box, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll just open my browser. Uh, I can provide you the copies of the JDC 2021 and the NCBP resolution. Unfortunately, I think I'm not in the position to share with you the DA memorandum circular number. Oh, it okay. has it has yet to be uh, released to the public, but maybe you can request from the Department of Agriculture. Okay, thank you very much, Raymond. 
uh, uh, in relation to that, uh, there's a question on the chat box and uh, Ryan Bedford from USDA has already responded to that question and you can see the link at the chat. Yes. Okay, for the, for the poll question, uh, here are the results. Uh, for question number one, most of you got it right. Thank you. And for question number two, uh, the correct answer should be, yes, the, the ABPI, Assistant Director for Regulatory Services. And for question number three, it should be the, it should be choice number letter D, product marketing and promotion, which is not, uh, covered by uh, the the revised joint department circular thank you very much for participating in the poll now we are opening the floor for the open discussion and uh, i have a first question here uh, from sorry i got also a technical issue uh, a while ago, I was cut off from, from Zoom. So uh, the first question was, I think this is addressed to, uh, to Raymond. What types of biosafety regulation is needed in case of genome editing crops as like as uh, GMO crops? Or, or basically, the, I think the question is, do we have the same regulatory approach for a gene edited crops and a GMO crop? Um, actually, uh, the first thing that we need to do, I think, is for us to determine whether the PBI product is a GMO or not, because it would be easier and cheaper for a product developer if it would fall under the category of non-GMO. However, if the uh, product of NBT would be considered as a GMO, then it has to undergo the joint department circular. So uh, to answer your question, yes, it would be uh, treated in the same uh, process if the product of uh, NBT is a GMO. If it's not, then a certificate of non-coverage would be issued and you will not be uh, actually required to undergo JDC1 series mm -hmm. of 2021. Can, can you add something to that, Dr. Ola, based on the experience of other countries? Uh, uh, at this point, I also I would like to clarify that when I was talking about genome editing, it is a plant breeding innovation, okay? So genome editing and genetic engineering, because I, I think I did not uh, clarify that earlier on. So the, the, the regulations that Mr. Raymond Corona has presented to us. So we already had a genome, a genetic engineering regulation before. Now we have improved it. The JDC one has been improved. This is for genetic engineering, uh, products of genetic modification. And then our PBI or plant breeding innovations include the genome editing. So there are three kinds of genome editing. First one is the SDN1, where it's a random. Uh, when there is a cut, you just join it together and it's basically the same as a conventional one. SD and it is not regulated uh, in the Philippines. I mean, because there is no new uh, protein, no new trait introduced, but it just joined. And then in uh, SDN2, there is going to be a primer and then SDN3 uh, is the genetically modified, considered as genetically modified, uh, if uh, Raymond can add to that. So when we say that the, uh, in uh, genetic engineering, we have already the process in the Philippines, the regulation is already in place. Mm -hmm. So most of the products that enter the Philippines, the products that we plant, they are already regulated by JDC1. It has been improved now. So it's, it, it's, it's more transparent and it's more uh, efficient. 
as what uh, Mr. Raymond provided to us, the information on that. And then the plant breeding innovations are new as it has not been released yet, but these are the things that we will be expecting to have in the plant breeding innovations. Thank you. Thank you, Mama Ola. Uh, there is one uh, question and a comment here um, from Cheryl Abayang. Based on the literature that I read, the supposed uh, first biotech product of the Philippines is the BT Talong, developed by IPB UPLB. However, there was a controversy here in the Bau region when the city mayor of the Bau ordered the uprooting of the BT Talong being field trialed in UP Mindanao because allegedly the researchers did not follow the protocol as required by the city. Is this the reason why Bangladesh is now the first country in Southeast Asia to commercialize BT Gridjal? Uh, yeah, it, it, it took place uh, years ago, and we're happy that uh, we are beyond that already. We have uh, the Supreme Court has already ruled that uh, most of the protests <laughs> on, on the field trials are mute and academic because we already have finished the field trials when the, the petition came in to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So now it's, it's passe, it's done. We have already approved the BT Talong for food feed and processing last year in June 2021. Now, the reason why Bangladesh became the first Asian country to plant it is because they did not have, um, they, they do have the political will to help their, their farmers, their eggplant farmers in producing <laughs> eggplant that does not need in, uh, uh, insecticide to kill the insects. So we have, um, so this is the beet, um, how do you call this? The eggplant fruit and shoot borer is the insect that gets into the eggplant and it's very hard to kill using insecticide because as soon as the, the worms get inside the, the, the eggplant, they will not be killed anymore. So we have more worms than eggplant in one eggplant fruit. So, uh, and then, so this took place in 2015 when the government of Bangladesh approved the food feed processing cultivation and even the Department of Agriculture minister, the, the lady, uh, Madame Chaudhry, she was the one who distributed the BT eggplant seedlings to the farmers. That's how the government of Bangladesh shows their support to our farmers, to their farmers uh, in support of uh, BT eggplant. We hope that uh, within the year when, when BT eggplant is approved for commercialization, I don't know if it's within the year or next year because it's already approved for food feed and processing, then we will also have the same benefits that BT eggplant brings to the Bangladeshi people. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ola. There is one question here from Pusau Tomita from Japan. May I know why regulatory system cannot base on products rather than the process? I believe the most important characteristic comes on products, not through process which was made. Uh, Raymond, or I think the Philippines is more on regulating the product rather than the process. Yeah. Actually, uh... <laughs> As we move along with the, we update our regulations, our guidelines, we really see to it that we uh, somehow emphasize that we are uh, regulating the product instead of the process mm -hmm. because it's like, it's easier actually and it's more, uh, it makes more sense to regulate the product instead of the process. So in our JDC 2021, the underlying concept there and the agreement between the technical working group members is that we relate the product and not the process. Uh, anything you can add, Dr. Ola, uh, based on yeah, the experience I, of other I, countries? I with, uh, yes, thank you. I, I agree with, uh, with Raymond. No okay. more addition. Thank no, you. no more addition. Thank you. Uh, I'm still trying to look at some of the questions. Uh, uh, th this one is addressed to you, Dr. Ola. Yeah. Can a genetically modified genome edited vegetable be considered as organic if it follows organic planting, breeding procedures like 
no use of chemicals, fertilizer, and pesticide. This is from Joseph Arvin Cruz. Hi, Joseph. He, he is a member of the PILJA. Yes, I've been communicating with him all along <laughs> for this mm -hmm. webinar. Thank you, Joseph, for the question. Actually, uh, scientifically and uh, using the cultural um, management of GM crops where you don't, or genome edited crops where you minimize the use of uh, synthetic fertilizers and um, no, no, synthetic uh, applications of uh, applications of synthetic um, uh, synthetic uh, pesticides and the use of organic fertilizers would be, should be called uh, organic even if you're using um, seeds which have been derived from GMs or genome editing. But the problem is in the Philippines, our organic uh, act has already um, I don't know if it has been changed, but I think it has been, it's now being deliberated that uh, using genome edited seeds or GM edited or GM seeds is considered as, um, can be considered organic if you don't use those synthetic uh, fertilizers and pesticides. So it is in our government's um decision whether it should be the organic act should be changed or there should be any uh additions or uh revisions on that so I, i'm not familiar anymore with the organic act as it is uh, do you have any idea raymond um actually i'm not so versed in even though i work for BAPS, i'm not really familiar because <laughs> um, uh, it's a specific board so mm -hmm. it's like parang sa NBT they have their own uh, determination group whether or accreditation group whether a uh, product is organic or not so I I think yeah it's a limited knowledge okay yeah, but that we have we have been talking about a coexistence where uh, farmers uh, farming buy the crops in one field and farmers planting um, organically grown crops in another side, they ca can coexist even if, um, but they should follow the time, the following time um, differences in planting and also in uh, the time and space um, in, in planting those crops. So actually in Mindanao, they, they are pushing for coexistence of GM and non-GM crops. Okay, there is one question here uh, addressed to Raymond. What are the specific, uh, this is from Parsons Hale from Central Luzon State University. And the question is, what are the specific updates, improvements in the provisions under the public participation process phases and activities in field trials under Article 5, Section 12? Right. of the JDC, specifically in public consultation, proper pace. Right. Okay. So, see, actually, Parsons is my classmate in one of my subjects in <laughs> master's. So, okay. in uh, public participation for the trial, actually, it's very unique because it really involves the engagement with the government unit. A public uh, hearing is required and a resolution should be uh, secured so upon checking with the DILG in the crafting of DG2021, we were informed that we cannot go away with the public hearing, although there are really some uh, lots of concerns about it, especially in the case of golden rice, that sometimes the non-scientific issues affect the regulatory process. And unfortunately, the local government code provides that any projects to be implemented in a locality should uh, uh, be should undergo public hearing and a resolution should be secured. So what we did is to actually clarify what is needed and to uh, just uh, emphasize that even the local government units are accountable under the ease of doing business law. So even them has their own timeline that they need to follow. And upon checking, I think ARTA one of, uh, can uh, give out administrative cases if it, was, it will be proven that your office or your agency or you as an individual 
uh, actually assess the delays in the uh, processes. So I for local government units, I think they're given 20 working days to actually come up with a solution. So that's for the uh, public uh, hearing phase up to the ones of the resolution, they are given 20 working days. So uh, actually, uh, our hands are tied in the NCBP or in the technical working group. We can only hope that this local government units through the Department of the Interior and local government will be informed that they're only, only given 20 working days. And then uh, some, some conditions still remains the same. You really have to uh, publish the public information sheet in conspicuous places that is uh, translated into the most commonly used language in the locality or area where you would implement your field trial activity. So I guess the improvement there is that we have a stronger linkage with the DILG. We hope that they would be instrumental so that we can connect better with the local government units <laughs> regarding the implementation of the Joint Department Circular. Okay, thank you, Raymond. I can see uh, Dr. Villegas raising her hand. You can now uh, shoot your question. Uh, can you please unmute and ask your question, please? Mambioli. Yes, thank you. Uh, we heard about the progress made in biotechnology as presented by Ola, Dr. Aldemita, and how we regulate the technology as presented by Raymond. For the public to have a better appreciation of the technology, we should be able to relate to the technology so we have better appreciation. My comment number one, living things, microbes, plants, animals, they continue to evolve through time. We descended from the chimp and millions and millions of years ago, we descended from simple organisms. It's not surprising that our DNA sequences as compared to the chimp is 99.5% similar. So whenever I talk to students, I'd say, if someone tells you, chonggo ka, I said, don't get I mad. Am. Just I say, hmm, he knows his genetics. He knows his evolutionary <laughs> genetics. We even share 50% yeah. of our DNA with banana. Oh. So we continue to evolve. Second point, scientists should be able to predict what will be needed tomorrow and work on it now because tomorrow will be too late. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was much younger, we worked on developing crops with drought tolerance, salinity tolerance, because we knew these factors are mm -hmm. important in the future. Like what Henry Ford said, if I gave people what they wanted, I would have given them a better horse. Because in America, they use carriage as transportation. But what did Henry Ford give us? The prototype car. So predict what will be needed tomorrow and work on it now because tomorrow will be too late. Yeah. According to, with the new technologies, people are always wary. But again, to quote Marie Curie, who worked on cancer treatment, she said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more, so we will fear less. So if we don't know anything about the subject, seek people, credible people, who can provide the correct information not just from what we Google. Mm -hmm. So that's all. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mambioli, for your comments. Uh, I have another question here. I, I think this is directed to Raymond. It, it is, is it still necessary to register if what is being propagated locally are for stock traits already registered? Uh, actually, no need. Uh, usually, the practice is the technology developer or the permit holder is actually the one who uh, registers it in approval registry. So once it is uh, given by safety permit for commercial propagation, essentially anyone can buy that, anyone can propagate that. 
uh, given that you don't plant it on the uh, LGUs who prohibits planting of GMO. So there's no need for that. As long as the uh, stock, article, uh, stock events are uh, included in the approval registry, then there's no need to mm -hmm. actually uh, duplicate the process. Okay. Thanks very much, Raymond. And I think... Oh, ben, uh, I forgot something. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, um, Gene editing, I always give this an example. In, now, um, humans are not the original gene editors. It's mm -hmm. nature, but we don't call them gene editing. We call them mutations. Example, almonds. Almonds used to be a poisonous nut, but because of a single base change from cytosine to guanine, in the transcription factor, no prunacin is produced by the plant. And prunacin was used by almonds to ward off insects. But because of this mutation, no prunacin, almonds became edible. So nature is the original gene editor. We just borrowed from nature. Okay. Thanks, Mambioli. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Nestor Angeles, and I think he's referring to labeling regulation. Is it required to publish or post in the product packaging if it is non-GMO product? Uh, Raymond, please, can you answer that? Um, no. Uh, here in our country, we don't have any laws requiring the labeling of GMO, non-GMO. Mm -hmm. So uh, simply said, uh, it is not required to put non-GMO or GMO in the uh, packaging of these products. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then another question. Does the risk from Venus Magai, does the risk assessment process include determination of any effect or change in the nutritional content of GM plants? Raymond? Uh, yes, of course, in the food and feed safety evaluation. Uh, that's uh, one of the components of the food and feed safety assessment. You have to determine if there's any change in the nutritional content of GM plants, you have to really check if it uh, paved the way for the development of anti-nutrients, it, it paved the way for the pro mm. production of, of toxins, or uh, such. Uh, those considerations are included actually in the current process of food and feed safety assessment. That's what the Bureau of Plant Industry Plant Safety Services do and uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration of the Department of Health. Okay, thanks. Uh, and, and somebody wants to know if you can give some update on the commercialization of uh, golden rice. Do you have any information about? Um, we don't really have uh, new information on the commercial production of um, uh, golden rice. I think Pam Ola mm -hmm. can provide uh, details on that. Uh, currently, we uh, after the propagation approval that we had last year, we have already launched, I mean, the project uh, proponents have already launched the golden rice and we had it when uh, the biotech center at the Philippine Rice Research Institute was inaugurated as well. So now we are putting together uh, all the dough shares. I think uh, all the, I think it's approved. So there is some, uh, how do you call the seed increase processes so that when uh, when it's going to be deployed to farmers then we can have the seeds ready and uh yeah well <laughs> thank you ryan bedford so he, he gave uh, a chat here the varietal registration for golden rice was recently approved yes that was last year which was noted by field rice a few years ago ah okay mm. So after the approval, then we'll have the varietal registration and it was approved last week. So we're moving forward fast and we hope that maybe within the year we'll have it on farmer's hands. Thank you, Raya. Thank you, uh, I'd like to, Yeah, I'd like to just uh, emphasize, uh, highlight the fact that we have already posted the link for the evaluation, for the webinar evaluation. We really would like to get your your comments on our webinar, but uh, please, after you submit this, don't don't uh, follow up, don't plug off because we're still continuing our discussion. I just want to tell you that you can copy the link and then you can um, answer the survey and then the, the certificate will come to you yeah. automatically. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so there's a question here from Lenita Banglista. Are the seeds that are genome edited already available in the market? And is the price expensive? I don't think we don't have yet uh, gene edited products in the market now. Yeah. And, and from Arthur Baria, what is the value of applicants for applicants to apply for determination whether their products are already known to be non-PBIs? based on the earlier definitions in the DA-808. Or objective is just to elaborate for transparency. Uh, can you clarify that, uh, Raymond? I guess the thing is, if you undergo the determination, uh, at the end of the process, you'll receive something like the certificate of non-coverage, which would, I think, be proven uh, very important should you do other activities using the PBI product. And it actually provides confidence to the applicant or to the product developer that the product is really not covered mm -hmm. by the GDC 2021. You have, you, you'll have more confidence in your product that the DA or the BPI has determined that your product is not GMO. Okay, there's a follow-up question here, also from Arthur Baria. From the operational uh, point of view, how will these new uh, developments, the JDs, the, the, the revised JDCs, the AO8, relate to our new, to our NCIC law, the uh, plant variety protection law, and later, if there is new bill on modern biotechnology products? All right, so... The thing with the these regulations in the uh, we whenever we come up with these uh, guidelines, we always make sure to emphasize that this regulation should not actually stop you to uh, uh, to adhere to other laws that may be relevant or applicable to your product. We just only provide, for example, in the JDC, the process of how by safety decision is being made and how can you really say that. Uh, it has be undergone the necessary evaluation, and that's with the high safety permit. With the DAMC uh, number eight, I assume that uh, with, it only provides the determination whether it is GM or not GM, but it doesn't say that it is. Uh, you should not uh, actually look into other applicable law that maybe that covers your product. So essentially, the the idea is. We want these laws, we want these policies to actually coexist and to complement each other. And when it comes time, it comes a time that a new modern biotechnology law is passed. Hopefully, we take the best practices that we are uh, implementing right now, our good experiences. So to ensure that the modern biotechnology law would be implemented uh, smoothly here in our country uh, with little to minimal hiccups. Apopen, you're mute. Uh, a comment from Dr. Pusau. Uh, as Dr. Aldimita stated, mutation is very precise and what is needed for safety aspects is, is conventional breeding. We must really consider about introduction of product-based evaluation. And do you have something to add for that, uh, Mamola? Well, I agree with him very well, very much. And uh, we're looking forward that the map that we have presented today will already be supportive of genome editing, that it would be product-based uh, in, in terms of evaluation. Thank you, Pasao, and best regards. I just want to announce that the link for the post-webinar evaluation is already posted in the chat box. And also for those who are asking, for uh, copies of the presentations. We will provide that in our ISA uh, website. You just, just go to the webinars and you can access uh, the presentation in PDF format and other presentations of our past webinars. So I think we don't have any more questions. So thank you very much participants for your 
questions and I think we are now ready for a closing remark. Do you agree with that, uh, Dr. Ola? Yes, please. Thank and you. And for the closing remark, uh, we will have with us Dr. Ryan Bedford. Uh, he is currently uh, agricultural attaché at U.S. Embassy Manila. He also served as deputy officer uh, at the Office of Agricultural Affairs, covering the full range of USDA FAS services, linking U.S. agriculture to the world to enhance export opportunities and global food security. He also served as international program specialist responsible for international agricultural research programs for Eastern Europe and Eurasia, including the Borlo Fellowship Program, Faculty Exchange Program, the Scientific Cooperation Research Program, and the Cochrane Fellowship Program for Agricultural Professionals. Mr. Beth Ford obtained his master's degree on management, finance, and leadership at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy and Bachelor of Arts in International Relation, major in Asian Studies from the Honors College of Florida International University. Uh, Ryan, please, your closing remarks. Okay, thank you so much, Pope Ben. Uh, and yeah, uh, great to be able to have my uh, my bio uh, highlighted there, um, yeah. and especially on, um, on Borlaug. So we do sometimes have Borlaug programs uh, focused on biotech in the Philippines, but I digress. Uh, hello, and uh, yeah, still morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm currently the acting agricultural counselor as our, our boss, Morgan Haas, is out of the country. And I represent the United States Department of Agriculture, Foreign Agricultural Service at the U.S. Embassy Manila. On behalf of USDA and the U.S. Embassy, I'd like to thank you for joining us today on biotechnology and re its regulations in the Philippines. I would like to offer my regards to everyone who spent part of their morning today as we learned about the revised policies governing this important topic. Thank you to the esteemed members of the Philippine Judiciary, to include justices, judges, court personnel, and lawyers, and to those from the general public and from the research community who have been vocal on the Q&A, maraming salamat. It was great to see such a large turnout to this webinar at over 200 participants. For those who joined the U.S. Embassy's biotech outreach programs in the past, you may recall how we met in person at the Diamond Hotel back in 2019 to hear from Dr. Carl Ramage. As the COVID pandemic prevented such events in the future, we shifted it in 2020 and 2021 to present online about new biotech trends and regulations with webinars in collaboration with ISA. Today's webinar is yet another evolution as we partnered with ISA through our USDA Food for Progress Be Safe project left by, led by Dr. Ramon Clarete. USDA is happy to continue to provide space to learn from experts and ask questions on biotechnology and hope we can someday soon return to in-person workshops. In today's session, we first heard from Dr. Rodora Azanza, President and Academician, National Academy of Science and Technology, and professor at the Marine Sciences Institute, UP Diliman. She highlighted the latest policy update in the Joint Department Circular and the importance in continuing to provide educational opportunities for all, including in the judiciary, to learn about these emerging technologies and the corresponding science-based policies. Dr. Ola Romero Adamita, ISA Executive Director, next discussed biotech products, applications, and benefits. She noted how these technologies can support larger crop production and improve food security while reducing input use conserving biodiversity, and lowering greenhouse gas emissions. She provided examples of traditional biotech products and examples from the newer field of genome editing, with many exciting applications in development and on the market that will provide benefits to consumers, farmers, and the environment. And our third speaker was Mr. Raymond Corona, Project Senior Technical Specialist at the National Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines, Department of Science and Technology. He explored the three following regulations, the Joint Department Circular of Series 2021, the NCBP Resolution Number 1 Series of 2020, and the Pending DA Memo Circular Series of 2022 on plant breeding innovations. We heard some of the regulatory improvements in the revised JDC and the other regulations that will streamline the previous policies and comply with the ease of doing business. Following these speakers, we had a robust Q&A session, the discussion spanning across the three regulations raised during the webinar, and many other important topics on biotechnology. I'd like to note the Philippines and the United States are longstanding partners in agricultural science with many examples of our strong collaboration. The U.S. supported as a construction of the Crop Biotech Center Munoz, which will house cutting edge research that will help level up Philippine agriculture. Our partnership extends beyond infrastructure as USAID was an early supporter of Golden Rice and BTI plan in the Philippines. The future is bright with the development of these traits, but just as important is the underpinning science and risk-based regulatory system that assesses the safety of the products and provides a pathway to commercialization. 
On that point, I would like to express my appreciation for the Philippines' example to the region and the world in biotechnology. Your years of experience with BT Corn showcase the initial benefits of biotech, while your development of golden rice demonstrates how biotech can boost nutrition of a widely consumed food and help to address vitamin A deficiency among vulnerable populations. Moreover, your sharing of expertise in international fora, such as the World Trade Organization, helps support improved regulatory systems beyond your borders as other nations learn from your approach. And the world will continue to do so as today's speakers noted as soon we publish memo circular on PBIs in the emerging realm of genome editing. These developments are all the more important as we face the daunting challenges of climate change and a warming planet. At the pre-summit of the UN Food Systems Summit, the US launched the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, aim for c with the goal of increasing and accelerating global innovation, research and development on agriculture and food systems in support of climate action. I'm excited to note that Philippines joined the United States and many other countries in this effort, which will include input use efficiency, resilient crop and livestock production, enhanced digital tools, inclusive, equitable, and sustainable food systems, and sustainable productivity improvements. Across our government agencies and beyond, the United States has been a friend, partner, and ally to the Philippines, including the ag biotech sector and its many stakeholders, including the Philippine judiciary. We look forward to continuing this partnership. Thank you for joining us this morning as we look about biotechnology and regulations in the Philippines. And thank you very much to our speakers for valued input and to the team at ISA led by Dr. Ola Romero Ademita and the Be Safe team led by Dr. Ramon Clarete for organizing this seminar. Thank you and have a great rest of your Friday. Okay, thank you very much, Ryan. I think that ends our webinar for today. Thank you very much, uh, Pilja, for assisting us in identifying the participants, uh, members of the judiciary. Thank you, uh, Windrock International and the XBSA project. And thank you, participants. With that, uh, we conclude today's webinar. And we hope to see you in other series of webinars that we will have in the future. Thank you.